My Little Pony friendship is magic. And she hates these privileged raven boys. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, which is also kind of hard to explain. Then I recommend you give up. Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about The Raven Cycle by Maggie Stiefvater. This is a series that I have been a fan of for a long time even though I only just finished it. Not the final book in the story of these characters because there's a spin-off series called The Dreamer Trilogy which I just started. The Raven Cycle is four books and I have now read those four books. Today I would like to talk about why I love them and help you figure out whether or not you should pick them up because they are not for everyone. So obviously like I said I'm a big fan I have been a big fan and I have praised these books very often ever since I started reading them. I liked the first book a whole lot. I liked the second one a lot as well. Uh, when I finally got around to the third one, I enjoyed that as well. And the fifth was the fifth one. The fourth one was a knockout. Uh, I, I loved it. So I didn't feel like I could do a video on the series until I'd finished it, of course. And I didn't really want to do standalone reviews because this series very much feels like one story split in four parts. By which I mean other series kind of have more distinct arcs within the individual books where you can kind of review it more on an individual basis. Whereas other series, like again, like for example, the First Law Trilogy, while I have posted standalone reviews for them individually, they really are three parts of one story. And of course any series is part of a larger story, but I think you know what I mean, <laughs> that it definitely feels more like you can't really split them up. You can't really talk about them or think about them individually. Now certainly I've heard people say they have favorites in the series. I think probably the first and fourth ones are my favorites. It'd be hard to say because again, I, they kind of bleed together in my mind because they all they don't really, I mean an example, which we're not reading Harry Potter anymore because she who must not be named is horrible. But those books, even though they are part of a larger series, even though they are part of an ongoing story, each book is conclusively like one year of school where there is a villain of the book and you defeat that villain and then you come back next year for more. And like overarching plot does continue to develop, but you can distinctly say like this book you remember being better than the other one because the big bad of the year was better or whatever. The Raven Cycle, I find myself not even really necessarily keeping track of how much time has gone by because they are in school. Uh, maybe I should explain what the Raven Cycle is if you absolutely have no idea and you've never heard of the Raven Cycle. So the Raven Cycle by Maggie Stiefvater, it does take place in a school setting. We're following, I guess I would say five main characters. However, it's not uh, limited to only their POVs. We kind of get a bunch of different POVs as needed. It's not exclusively one person's story. It's not strictly the POVs of like this group of friends, which are the five. It's just kind of random. <laughs> we get a bunch of different POVs. We predominantly get the friend group, but we get others as well. And they are in high school. But again, it doesn't really follow. I mean, there's four books. So one might be forgiven for assuming that it's going to be freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year. But it is absolutely not that. It's just school, I guess, is happening for these kids. But it just doesn't seem to really be an issue. Like you're not getting a lot of like, actually, I say it takes place in a school setting. It takes place in a town where these these kids do go to a school, but you hardly see the school. They allude to the school. The fact of the school plays a big part in their dynamics because it's a privileged prep school called Agley and B Academy. And in fact, the series gets its name from the school that they attend because the shield or the emblem or the whatever it's called, the, the logo of the school, it has a raven on it. And so these boys that attend this prep school are raven boys. And the main, the female main character, Blue Sergeant, she goes to public school, she's poor, and she hates these privileged raven boys. But then she ends up being best friends with four of them. But so that's where the series, The Raven Cycle, and the first book, The Raven Boys, gets its name. So the fact of the school, as I said, is important to these character dynamics, but they really hardly are in school. Like, and I don't, I mean, Blue apparently goes to school as well at public school, but like you really never see that. So it doesn't really feel like school is a really great and convenient way to know the passing of time in books because you're like, oh, okay, well, it's this point in the school year or like we moved on to the next school year. But since they kind of don't talk about school very much and you don't see them at school very much, school is just kind of like amorphously a fact in their lives, but isn't really a fact in the story. So what is it about if it's not about school? Which is also kind of hard to explain. So it takes place in Henrietta, Virginia, which is a, I actually don't know if that's a real place. I think that it is, but I actually have no idea. Virginia is obviously a real place. So this is a very rural kind of backwater place. And there's like this fancy prep school, but like sort of the town around it where Blue lives with her uh, mother and her aunts isn't very rich or bougie at all. There's a lot of sort of nature, woods. Uh, it's not very industrialized. It's very much like the countryside, kind of. And what's also special about Henrietta is that this is a point where three ley lines converge. And so 
if uh i believe all of the books i may be wrong yeah i think all of the books on the naked cover i don't know if you can see on camera it's pretty bright um but all of the books have like embossed on them the three ley lines because that is central to the story and um on the spines as well where it says the raven cycle you can see the ley lines and arguably oh he's definitely not the main character but kind of the main character or at least the character who sort of incites a lot of the action of the story is uh, Richard Gainsey and they just call him Gainsey and he's obsessed with finding this old Welsh king that was supposed to be buried he believes somewhere in Henrietta eons ago and that this Welsh king is, is has magical properties and that when he was buried he's really just kind of sleeping and that he's been following all this sort of like mythology and legend about this Welsh king and the belief is that if you find the Welsh king and you awaken him, then he must grant you a favor. And so the Raven boys, these four boys who go to Aglianby Academy, mainly because of Gainsey, have been trying to track down their king. And so they're mainly doing this because Gainsey wants to do this. The other three are just kind of in it with him. And then Blue ends up being in it with him. Now Blue, she herself and her mother and her aunts, her mother and her aunts are psychics. And that's what they do for a living as well. So they do like tarot readings for people. They have like a hotline and Blue lives in this kind of like chaotic house where it's kind of everybody for themselves all the time. They're poor. So everything's kind of like broken and shabby and used 10 times. She sews her own clothes. There's another reason she hates <laughs> the privileged boys who go to Aglian B. She works, I think at a diner. Uh, she's not at school. She bicycles everywhere. And again, it's like chaos at home. There's always like tea leaves everywhere and her aunts are incredibly eccentric. And Blue herself, she's not a psychic, but she is uh, like an ample fire so she can help her aunts be more psychic by being near or around them or touching them and then as the series develops anything else that is magical anything else that is supernatural is amplified by blue's presence or by blue uh, encountering it or uh coming in contact with it so that's blue's deal and then the other sort of set up for this whole situation is that her aunts blue's aunts um they sort of part of their psychic deal is that there's do they call it the corpse road um, they basically are able to see souls on this sort of like road to the afterlife, but psychically because of the ley lines. It's hard to explain, and that's mainly explained in the first book. But in any case, they see the souls of the dead, of the future dead, on the corpse road. And so they do see Gainsey's corpse, or Gainsey's soul, on the corpse road. And then later, when she actually meets Gainsey and becomes friends with him, she holds this secret that she knows that he's going to die. She's seen him, his soul on the corpse road. I keep calling it the corpse road. I really hope that's what it's called. So as you can see, like, it's hard to explain because there's kind of a lot of pieces going on at the same time. And they're all kind of following up their own personal interests. And you begin to learn that there's more to all of these characters and their backstories and how they intersect and how their problems and their interests overlap or collide or are in conflict with one another. And basically everything becomes very wibbly wobbly. <laughs> timey-wimey and bizarre. And so basically the vibe and the tone and what you're getting out of this series is these young people who are exploring all kinds of wondrous and unsettling magics that they don't fully understand as they're pursuing the quest, uh, as they're pursuing their goal of finding their king, which is also kind of an amorphous quest. It's kind of almost like the white whale, so to speak. Like it's just become like a mission for Gainsey where the mission itself is almost more important than actually finding him. And yet finding him is also really important and becomes more important as they begin to desperately need a favor. And there's like a lot of interpersonal dynamics that become interesting. There are, of course, other people who are also interested in finding this old Welsh king. And so that becomes dangerous <laughs> if other people are out for this as well. So there's just kind of a lot going on in these books, which is kind of why it's hard for me to identify different arcs within the books or to explain it cohesively because there's just a lot going on. <laughs> and so you're just basically following these characters and their messy relationships and the crazy mind-bending magics that they're coming in contact with. There's a lot of sort of nature vibes because they are kind of in the backwoods and a lot of the, the magic is coming from or is connected to this forest that becomes like a almost a character in the story called Caves Water. And it's just... <laughs> It's bizarre. It is bizarre. And Maggie Stiefvater's writing style is also bizarre. But it's a bizarre that really works for me. 
So, like, for example, like, I just flipped to kind of a random page because Maggie Stiefvater's writing style is kind of the same throughout, where, like, the imagery that she evokes or, like, the way she just goes about describing things or explaining things is unconventional. <laughs> so this is, like, the very beginning of the first book, so it's not spoilers or anything. So we're kind of getting to know Blue and her aunts. So, unlike Blue, who didn't tend toward patience, Neve was a regal statue on the old church wall, hands folded, ankles crossed beneath a long wool skirt. Blue, huddled, shorter and thinner, was a restless, sightless gargoyle. It wasn't a night for her ordinary eyes. It was a night for seers and psychics, witches and mediums. That's just kind of like a small taste of what her writing style is like. So describing them as statues and gargoyles, I mean, obviously they aren't, they're people, but it's meant to evoke that imagery. And it, the whole thing just is kind of like that all of the time. The way things are described is always kind of in terms of symbols and metaphors and um, she uses words to describe things that are absolutely not a description of that thing. I think they're in the newest uh, or the new trilogy, um, the Dreamers trilogy or the Dreamer trilogy, whatever it's called. There was uh, a line that when I was buddy with Jess, she was like, what does that even mean? I was like, I love it. Um, and it was something like she had a smile like she had a smile like a nuclear fallout zone or something like that or a smile like a nuclear bomb. And like, what is a smile? What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, I like it because while it does absolutely nothing to describe how this person looks, it does convey the impression that this person is meant to be leaving you with, which I think is a really effective way of describing something rather than telling you that their you know, lips are this big or this thin and this color and that they have straight or crooked teeth and that they're smiling so broadly that you can like see their cheeks being pushed up but that their eyes are kind of narrowed and like, one person might interpret that as like, so I, I, they look constipated or whatever, but like by just simply saying that the smile looks like, I think it was a nuclear bomb or nuclear explosion. I don't know, but you get the, uh, the vibe. That leaves you in no doubt of like the kind of impression you are meant to be left by this character and what it means when they smile. That it's not something joyous, it's not something pleasant, it's something alarming. <laughs> I think at one point too they say something like that Ronan Lynch's smile is like a razor. I think that might say that a lot. Which again is not helpful as an actual description. Like if you're an artist um, looking for a description that you can use to sketch them, not especially helpful. But as a reader, I have a very clear, clear image of my mind of like what type of person Ronan Lynch is. <laughs> and Ronan Lynch is my favorite character, so I was very excited that the spinoff series is about Ronan Lynch. Ronan Lynch is one of the Raven boys, and uh, he's got a chip on his shoulder like none other. <laughs> so her writing style and the type of story that it is, is kind of just wild, amorphous, hard to pin down. But if it's your thing, then it's gonna be hardcore your thing. And if it's not your thing, it's never gonna become your thing. So like, if you start reading the series and you're like, this writing style is bonkers and I, what is even happening? Then I recommend you give up because it's gonna be like that for the whole series. I personally love it. All of those wild descriptions, they totally work for me. And they really make this series like the evocative, vibey, just kind of atmospheric, more experience than story to me. I really feel like The Raven Cycle is something that I experienced rather than read because I felt like I was in this greenery and surrounded by magic that was inexplicable and that the, the magic of friendship is there but not in like a corny way. It's not, I think that's what Brony, the My Little Pony friendship is magic. I mean, friendship is kind of magic in The Raven Cycle, but it's not, oh, the real magic was the friends we made along. I mean, no, it's it's messy and it's dark. It's actually very dark. This series, which is another reason that I like it because it gets into, well, death, <laughs> actual death quite a bit. So I personally adore this series, but again, it is not for everyone. It's not the kind of series that can be like, anyone should pick this up. This is for everyone. This is so wonderfully written that no one could fail to love it. I know a lot of people that don't like it. I, I, I understand why. <laughs> it really works for me, but it is definitely, I'm not even an acquired taste. I'm not gonna say, well, keep reading because you'll acquire the taste because I don't think that's true, but it's definitely a taste that's not for everyone. It's a distinctive flavor. It's kind of like Marmite. You either really love it, which I do, or it is not your cup of tea and it's not likely to become your cup of tea if you eat it more. <laughs> so, The Raven Cycle. Should you read it? I don't know. I think you should give it a try because it is unique. If nothing else, it is unique. I don't think you'll have read anything else that's anything like The Raven Cycle. So for that alone, give it a go. But let me know in the comments down below if you have given it a go and if that went well or not. If what you've heard about it, if that aligns with what I said, if you have read it, if you agree with me about how I described it, whatever you want, let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe. And join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you.